Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to the 23rd National Information Systems Security Conference. Uh, just like a church, we have empty seats up front for those in the back, so come on down. Uh, going over some of the highlights today, we're going to have the uh, opening plenary right now. At uh, 5.30, we'll have an awards ceremony. Uh, I'd also like to uh, talk about some of the rules of engagement around here. We're all here to learn new ideas. It's difficult to learn them, and it's difficult to teach them if you have your cell phones on. <laughs> so please turn them off. You know, enjoy the conference, learn some new ideas. I'd like to uh, congratulate the, the Best Paper Awards. A thousand of you at least missed this morning's Best Student Paper Award. It was uh, the case for beneficial computer viruses and worms, a student's perspective, by Greg Moore of Mississippi State University. The best paper will be presented uh, this evening uh, award, and we haven't told them, and they're going to hear it for the first time today. It is uh, being presented tomorrow at 1.30. It is analysis of terminal server for thin clients in a high assurance network by Dr. Cynthia E. Irving and Stephen R. Balmer of Naval Postgraduate School. I encourage you to read the paper. I encourage you to go to their session tomorrow at 1.30. Uh, there will be buses at the end of the day. There will be buses after tonight's reception. Uh, the reception will occur right after the award ceremony. Uh, the buses will be going back to what's commonly referred to as Cardiac Hill near NSA. Don't be late or you'll be walking back to Cardiac Hill. On Wednesday night, we'll have a banquet. We expect uh, it'll be at the Renaissance Hotel, which is two blocks down across the street, across from the pavilion at Inner Harbor. Uh, we will have bus service afterwards. On Thursday, we'll have workshops starting in the afternoon. I'd like to introduce uh, my boss, Larry Martin. Following his return from NSA from a five-year tour, as the InfoSec Liaison Officer over at the U.S. Delegation to NATO Headquarters in Brussels, uh, he became the Director of the National Computer Security Center. He's the fifth uh, director uh, since we started uh, almost 20 years ago. He also chairs the Subcommittee on Information System Security uh, of the National Security Telecommunications and Information Systems Security Committee, otherwise known as the NSTSIC. Larry? Uh, thank you, Jack, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And I'd also like to add my welcome to all of you to the 23rd National Information Systems Security Conference. Uh, after watching the video that was made for us by NSA's uh, Information Systems Security Organization corporate communication staff, uh, there should be no doubt in anyone's mind why we're gathered here uh, for these next four days and about the amount of work that we all have ahead of us. Uh, I'm sure you'll agree that it's good to be back in Baltimore after a two-year absence. Um, I'm happy to tell you that we'll be back in Baltimore again next year. Uh, however, as you can see from the dates that are listed in the back inside cover of your program, that we'll be experimenting with a three-day format next year. Uh, and this is only one of numerous changes that we anticipate making uh, to this conference. Uh, we're in the process of doing a zero-based review, a comprehensive analysis of all aspects of this conference. And I know most of you attend numerous conferences during the year, and at those conferences, you're asked to fill out critiques and evaluation <coughs> forms. But I can't emphasize strongly enough the importance of getting those feedback forms from you this year. We've put a lot of time and effort into developing a form that has questions that will be very helpful to us in being able to meet your needs while still being able to make the changes that are uh, necessary to the conference. So you'll be reminded uh, throughout the conference to fill out your feedback forms and get them to us. And I want to thank you in advance for taking the time and effort to do that. And now it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you the man who is leading the efforts to transform the National Security Agency to meet the technological changes of the 21st century. He's here to give us his views on the evolution of information assurance particularly as it relates to national security. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming the director of NSA, the chief of the Central Security Service, Lieutenant General Michael V. Hayden. Uh, 
Senator, thanks very much, and good morning to all of you. Thanks so much for the uh, opportunity to come and talk to you a bit this morning. This is a, an important event for me, uh, not just professionally and representing the agency here before this very important body, uh, but also personally. Uh, Mike Jacobs, John Nagengas, and all the other folks within our DI director do a, do a wonderful job day in and day out. Uh, they are a powerful engine, not just within the National Security Agency, but within the U.S. government uh, to do the things that are right for America. Uh, they also perform a personal task for me, which is essentially to form my conscience as director. Because, as I think most of you know, NSA is, and I'll use this soft-sided term, this, this warm, fuzzy term, is a blended agency. Okay? It has both an offensive and a defensive mission. Okay. America's code makers and code breakers, information assurance and SIGINT. And it's fairly easy, uh, given some of the things that are going on in the broader world, uh, to have one director's attention kind of drift in the direction of the offensive side, the SIGINT side, uh, simply because there are a lot of challenges out there, challenges that have been created uh, perhaps by uh, decreased budgets, as well as all the te technological challenges you're, you, you well know we're faced with. Whereas on the information assurance side, uh, Mike has both the problems and solutions of dealing with an expanding program, of dealing with a program that's getting a bit more money and a bit more manpower. Now you need to put the footnote there. That tells you what the nation and the nation's leaders think about what Mike's directorate is, directorate is doing. But in a sense, it's easy for a director to drift over to a program and focus on a program where perhaps dollars and resources aren't as free flowing, aren't as much coming from downtown. And so it's good for me, and Mike does this routinely, uh, to make sure I understand how important, and let me choose my words carefully here, this aspect of our unitary mission at NSA is. Okay? Not this mission as opposed to that mission. So with that as background, let me, let me just share with you some thoughts that we at the agency and, and I as director have about our common enterprise here this morning, which is information assurance. Okay? Uh, as Larry mentioned, uh, throughout the agency, we're trying to keep pace with the rapid evolution in technology, and that translates this morning in a rapid evolution in information security. Uh, let me go ahead and, and show a couple of visuals here and show you how our our thought processes have migrated over the past years. Okay. And I'm going to show it to you kind of an evolution of a taxonomy of terms, beginning first of all with what you see up there now, COMSEC, communication security, which is kind of where our roots begin. Okay. And that emphasized the means of protecting information and focused almost exclusively on military and, and diplomatic users. I'll use a phrase uh, that Mike and his folks have pointed out to me. Um, focusing here on, on a desired output. Okay. The next level in, in our, the migration of our thinking was InfoSec, information security. And here, the migration was, not, was, was from not so much desired output, but to desired outcome, if, if you know what I mean. Uh, the, the first was more narrowly focused. Uh, you could have a good day if you did your job. Wait, I just heard a cell phone. <laughs> All right, fess up. Whose is it? <laughs> and the first concept under ComSec, hey, my system worked. My, my encryption wasn't broken. I'm sorry the bad guys read the message, but it wasn't my fault, you know, quoting the immortal Han Solo in Star Wars 1. Okay? As you expand your understanding of your mission, though, it's not desired outputs, but desired outcomes. If someone has busted your information security, you have a problem. Okay. The next level of thought was information assurance. And here, we're expanding our range of desired outcomes from not just protecting the information, okay. we expanded our range of desired outcomes to detecting and reacting to attacks against our information and information systems. And as we did that, we had to broaden our understanding of our customer set uh, boldly into the private sector. And then finally, if you're looking for a, a capstone phrase, 
for the evolution of our thinking at this point in time. I'll use the phrase information operations. Okay. PDD 63 in 1998 set, set some clear goals for us in eliminating significant physical and cyber vulnerabilities to nation's critical infrastructure. Okay. Now, since most of that infrastructure is owned by the private sector, achieving that goal that the President's outlined, outlined for us under this rubric of information operations and uh, critical infrastructure protection requires a joint and very well-coordinated effort between the government and the private sector. So what you see here is, is not so much a linear progression. I think the graphic is about right. It shows a growth in our concept as to what it is our business encompasses. As an airman, uh, several assignments, assignments ago, I was down at the Air Intelligence Agency in San Antonio. And, and we had a little mantra that, that we used to refer to all the, times, all the time when we referred to that last phrase you see there, information operations. Okay, that mantra was gain, exploit, attack, and defend information. And I'll come back to that later because there are some legal structures that, that into which we must fit in order to perform those four verbs, gain, exploit, defend, and attack information. But moving beyond the verbs, I, I need you to kind of step up to where we were thinking down in San Antonio at that time and where we are thinking currently at the agency. Information is now a place. It is a place where we must ensure American security as surely as we had to ensure American security in those other places we used to and still operate in, land, sea, air, and space. It has taken on a dimension within which we will conduct operations to ensure American security. Now, with that expanding definition, uh, we've changed our structures within NSA. We're now taking on new missions. Okay? About 50 years ago, when you look down at the bottom of that chart around ComSec, we we're developing cryptographic materials and secure communications gear. And we still do that. I mean, we're not saying those go away. It's a broader, encompassing definition of what we're doing, though, OK? We now offer systems engineering services, security assessments, evaluations, aggressive testing services. We've done pioneering work to better protect e-commerce. We've done pioneering work in biometrics. Okay. In the old world, down the bottom of that chart, under ComSec, governments had almost an absolute monopoly in the relevant technology and techniques. Okay. As the concepts you see exhibited on that slide have progressed and expanded, we clearly no longer exercise that monopoly. Our position has evolved towards cooperation and partnership, not just with other agencies within our own government, but with the private sector. Our core competency remains unchanged. We identify vulnerabilities and we correct vulnerabilities. But we're now doing that in an entirely different, an entirely different context. Okay. Now, I think you all recognize perhaps better than I that it's just not this intellectual context that has changed, that this intellectual context is actually driving and is driven by the communications and telecommunications environment. Okay. In the past, we protected the communications links in structured, hierarchical communications network. Okay. Uh, ComSec was achieved by cryptography and physical isolation of the network, and creating kind of a closed system. It was a barrier system approach, the perimeter wire approach, if you will. Okay. Today, though, and that's not what we do. Today, we operate on a vast network of networks. And we need a systems integration approach. <laughs> as, you, as you reflect on that graphic, think along with me uh, to a phenomenon that I witnessed during the last time American forces were in combat, okay, when American forces were conducting within the NATO alliance, the air war over Kosovo and Serbia. Okay. Our information that we needed for that operation resided and traveled on the same global network used by our adversaries during that confrontation. As we were moving information along this globally 
interconnected telecommunications infrastructure, so too was Slobodan Milosevic and his government. Okay. And beyond that kind of common highway approach to communications, adversaries, uh, well, adversaries are no longer characterized as simply the traditional nation state. They can be cyber terrorists, the malicious hacker, the malicious hacker or even the non-malicious hacker. All of them can cause great harm to that highway. A great challenge for us today is protecting U.S. communications, but not just the discrete communications between point A and point B. It's our ability to ensure continuity of operations even when portions of this network have become compromised or degraded. Remember that gain, exploit, defend, and attack mantra I mentioned a few minutes ago. The National Security Agency is not empowered to do that attack thing. Okay? That is beyond our writ based upon the policy of the, of the U.S. government. But as the United States government begins to think about what it should or wants to do when it is under attack, it raises some really interesting questions that we all have to work through in the context of our overall democracy. Okay? Just think about it, what an American response to an I.O. attack may consist of. It may simply consist of fending off and protecting yourself from the attacker and restoring service as quickly as possible. Kind of a passive defense. It, it, it could consist of a passive defense joined by an approach to law enforcement to try to go do something to prosecute the attacker. I think we can all intellectually engage the concept that at least an option would be retaliation or counterattack, either physical counterattack or a cyber counterattack in order to defend our systems. And in the case of a cyber or I.O. counterattack, think with me, please, if you will, the phrase I used way at the beginning of this about the blended mission rather than two parts or even two missions, but the blended mission of the National Security Agency. In the case of an I.O. counterattack, the distinction between securing and exploiting communications, which is the old distinction between ComSec and SIGIT, isn't it, really quickly begins to get blurred. Now, I mentioned all along in this that we can't move forward, at least we can't move forward efficiently and effectively without partnerships with the private sector. Okay? In my view, and you're seeing me up here in an Air Force uniform, our relationship with the private sector has to be in many ways the kind of relationship America's Air Force has had with the private sector in the past. I am fond of saying that the American Air Force is the military expression of the American aviation industry. That you don't get America's Air Force without the underpinnings of that aviation industry. I'm beginning to explore the thought in my own head and heart that the National Security Agency must in fact ultimately be the security expression of the American telecommunications and computer industry. Okay. How else does our society develop the tools we need to do what it is our agency has been charged to do? And so partnership with industry is really important to us. Okay. And we do that in many ways. Uh, we have, for some years now, the Commercial Comsec Evaluation Program. Since 1985, we've entered business relationships with vendors to develop produce products that have a direct and clear benefit to improving security for DOD customers. Okay. We've also partnered with federal agencies. I think most of you are familiar with the National Information Assurance Partnership. Partnered with the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, to authorize and accredit commercial evaluation facilities to conduct independent third-party validation of security-enabled COTS products. We've even established partnerships with, with foreign governments in an effort to establish common criteria to evaluate information technology, security products, and systems. Okay. Now let me just add how difficult this task is for all of us, even in this alliance, even in this partnership. Frankly, real assurance is deficient in far too many commercial products. Now, by assurance, let me make sure you understand what I mean. We mean that the system will operate without errors in the presence of malice. 
and in the event of system failure, that the system will fail safe and recover. It's kind of like all those things on your automobile, seat belts, airbags, crumple zones, interlock brakes, things that are there all the time, don't interfere with the normal operation of your car, but in the event of an emergency, those things save the lives of drivers and passengers. There's a great cost for not having those kinds of things in our information assurance world. I noticed on the video uh, a few references to the love bug virus. And I'll just ask each of you to figure in your own heads and estimate what the cost of that was around the globe to information and information systems. Okay. And, and while it would be nice if foreign countries had effectual laws on the books that would allow us to prosecute and therefore deter that kind of activity, I think the outcome of that case teaches us something quite different and it's something that is beyond our direct control. Now, if the cost of insecurity is so great out there on the internet, just think of the cost of insecurity to civilian and military government operations. It's potentially much greater. We in the DOD, we in the Department of Defense, are clearly going to use a mix of government and commercial products, but frankly, commercial products have to be good. Product differentiation in the forms of features really doesn't add the kind of value I'm talking about this morning. Only the certainty of information assurance produces product value in terms of the conversation we're having here today. NSA, I believe, is a good partner in that effort. We offer our understanding not only of a particular information assurance problem, but we can offer an understanding of mature, comprehensive knowledge of information assurance systems. A final note. Uh, technology and tools can help us be more efficient and more effective. But you, you come right down to what makes a difference. It's an awful lot about people and processes, perhaps even more so than technology and tools. Discipline, training, leadership count for more than budgets and bandwidth and blame. In the information age, every leader, that's a military commander or a corporate manager or a technical director, must recognize the strategic value of information and internalize, I mean realize in the actual meaning of that word. Okay. Realize the strategic value of information and internalize the need to protect it and their information systems. We can't simply overlook personal responsibility for sound security. In the end, information security is something that we do seven by 24, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. It's simply not just something that we buy. Let me assure you that uh, the words that I've shared with you this morning are words that we take very seriously at the National Security Agency. We take them seriously on two dimensions, on our contribution to the nation, which I alluded to at the beginning of my remarks, but we also take them seriously in terms of our own defense. After all, if you understood in, even in small measure my description of the agency's mission, just think how lucrative a target we must be for those who would intend malice to the United States of America. And so we are very serious about information assurance. We take our responsibilities very seriously, and you will find us a very willing partner with you uh, to defend both ourselves and the United States of America. Thank you all very much for the opportunity to be with you here today. Thank you, General Hayden, for those very fine remarks. Uh, our next, next item on the agenda is my introduction of Dr. Bill Mihuron. Dr. Mihuron is the uh, Director of the Information Technology Lab and the Chief Information Officer at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, uh, Dr. Mihuron has held a number of senior management and technical positions uh, in the public and private sectors, among such things as the Acting Deputy Undersecretary at NOAA, Director of Research and Engineering at the 
National Security Agency, and a number of senior positions uh, in, in the private sector managing technology and uh, research projects in, in many uh, technical areas, including security as well. Uh, he has a Bachelor of Science in engineer, uh, Electrical Engineering from Purdue University, and he has a Master's in the PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Bill Mehiron. Thank you, Tim. <clears throat> I, uh, before we started today, I told Tim to keep my introduction very short, <laughs> and he did a good job. Um, first of all, before I get into the uh, remarks I'd like to give this morning, I want to thank uh, General Hayden for his remarks. I think that uh, everything he said is something that uh, made me feel particularly good about the partnership that we have with NSA. And uh, I think that uh, together, both NIST and uh, others in the Department of Commerce that we're part of, really, I think, can do a wonderful job going forward to deal with the issues that uh, General Hayden talked about. On behalf of uh, NIST, I, I certainly want to thank you all for being here and uh, also like to welcome you back to Baltimore. Uh, as some of you know, it's always a struggle to get in here because of the tremendous competition for space in this convention center. I walked in here this morning and uh, First thing I saw was a sign welcoming the people to the fall SAE meeting on lubricants. And I said, uh-oh, just because of a football game, we got bounced out of here. But uh, fortunately, that's not the case. I think you'll enjoy the meeting. Uh, we have uh, really a conference program that a lot of people have worked very hard on. And I think it should meet your uh, needs for staying abreast of the fast pace of change in the IT security area. I certainly want to thank all the NIST and NSA staff that were involved in the arrangements. Uh, as usual, uh, this is going to be, I'm sure, our very best conference of the year. And as some of you who are familiar with NIST uh, operations in general know that we give a lot of conferences every year. And uh, this is, as, as usual, the best uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the lot. While we all recognize that important that uh, to incorporate uh, a certain amount of time in our lives for education and training. I, I think that I, I would like to thank all of you from all parts of the government and the private sector for taking the time to participate in this meeting. I think it really does make a difference uh, in terms of people making this kind of investment. And I hope and expect by the end of the week that uh, we all will be better prepared to deal with some of the security challenges facing us. Um, I would like to take a few minutes to talk about some of those challenges. And I guess I, I come at it from a, a slightly different perspective uh, than General Hayden in that NIST has a uh, fairly unique charter under the Computer Security Act to worry about what goes on on the civilian side of the government. And so we're heavily involved as are other parts of the Department of Commerce. But even more importantly, uh, the Department of Commerce, as you all know, has a very unique role with respect to U.S. industry. And we uh, not only worry about the civilian side of the government, but also try to do things that, in the end, will result in a much more robust U.S. industry in these areas as well as others, and also a much stronger economy. Uh, <clears throat> as I'm sure a lot of you know, federal agencies are becoming much more reliant on information operations, as General Hayden described. Uh, we're seeing more and more of that. Along with that, there's also a great dependency occurring on commercial software and related systems. Uh, in order to meet our uh, security objectives in these areas and protect our operations, we need to be very smart customers and demand the highest possible uh, quality in software. Software has to be robust, convenient, affordable, have security mechanisms built in, and while at the same time meeting the functional requirements of, of the users. Um, this has been a particular uh, difficult situation for a lot of us uh, in terms of users of uh, commercial software in that over the past many years, much of the software that's been created really has not had security as a priority. And we're really in a tremendous catch-up game. But as um, 
we, we hope uh, meetings like this will allow us in the industry that uh, produces the uh, products and so forth to do a much better job going forward uh, in terms of uh, developing the kind of requirements that uh, we would like to see. Um, there's no question that um, the functionality has to be there. The IT business, the software business is a tremendously competitive business. Uh, people having been in the industry, I know that uh, uh, performance, uh, meeting functional requirements uh, are at utmost in most of the people's minds. And uh, they're, in a, as I said, in a very competitive environment. And, and many, many times security simply has not been the highest possible objective. And also on the user side, we, we also have to be a little, do a little better job, I think, in specifying the kind of security requirements that we would like to see. Not always have we done that job in the way we, we possibly should have. As I said, a challenge facing industry is how to produce such software, and I think there's a real role for the government to play in this area. Uh, we work very closely at NIST with the private sector and the, and the IT industry in particular, and I think partnerships are really the, the way to go. We have a number of instances where we have partnered in other IT technologies with the private sector, and we found that there's been tremendous payoff. So uh, we think that's what we really need to do in this arena as well. At the same time, I think that as users, we have to do a better job of clearly articulating the security needs to the industry, both in terms of product and service providers. We need to strive as, as consumers in the public and private sector to send clear and precise signals as to our security requirements. Vendors uh, understandably have difficulty addressing multiple inconsistent and perhaps orthogonal user needs. This can be particularly true in the COTS area where, as I said earlier, performance is clearly the, the principal driver. That said, <coughs> vendors want to hear not just what we want, after all, wish lists are fairly easy, but also that users will buy these pro services and products which meet their needs with the right the combination of quality, cost, and insurance. Too many times in the past, there's been really concerted efforts in some sectors of the uh, IT industry to develop uh, ver uh, products with very strong security features, and then they discover to their dismay that uh, nobody's interested in paying the price for those products, and they're not willing to accept the possible degradation in performance. And that's really created a little bit of a problem, I think, in terms of the challenge we have in getting the software industry as a whole to really focus on this area. Specifications that uh, in this area need to be developed, but they need to be de developed in a way that's a partnership with the private sector. We have a great deal of experience doing that through uh, a lot of mechanisms, industry consortia. We've just, over the last two years, done a, an extremely uh, significant amount of work with the private sector in an area called XML, which is one of the building blocks for uh, e-commerce going forward. That's a perfect example of how government can engage industry to get our requirements into specifications that private sector companies build to. And I think it represents a terrific model for us to use going forward with the private sector. Um, there's lots of other organizations in the private sector, some semi-official, uh, ANSI, the IEEE, the IETF, when it comes to the internet. All these vehicles provide a wonderful opportunity for us to partner with the private sector to ensure that the products and services they uh, supply will meet our needs going forward. Uh, speaking of evaluation, challenges also confront us here. We uh, also have to use a, an evaluation pro process that gives us confidence in the, uh, uh, that the IT products we use will meet the security specifications. Uh, General Hayden mentioned the NIAP program. That clearly is a wonderful starting point to assure uh, IT products uh, will uh, provide the capability we need, but we really have to build upon that. That's only a starting point, and we have to get the IT industry, the product developers, much more engaged than we have in the past. And one of our objectives at NIST is try to ensure that that takes place. Certainly, we need to uh, educate and train ourselves to use the uh, systems and software effectively. 
that's the other uh, leg of the stool, if you will. I might mention that from our perspective, perhaps the most significant vulnerability we, we all face are poor and untrained system administrators and system administration. Uh, in our own experience at NIST, where we have uh, a modest uh, number of 4,000 users in our IT environment, uh, probably six or 7,000 desktop systems and several thousand servers, our biggest problem is ensuring that the system administration that uh, is applied to all of those systems is done in a robust manner by individuals that are properly trained in information assurance and information operations. That is a very, very major uh, problem we all face. And certainly in the private sector and other parts of the government, uh, I think the problem uh, is even greater because we at NIST fortunately have a, a cadre of people that really know something about this subject and uh, I think are uh, a tremendous in-house asset. On the research front, um, we all have invested heavily in uh, lots of different interesting solutions, firewalls, intrusion detection, VPNs, and so forth. And we must continue to make those kinds of investments uh, to ensure that we put systems together that uh, provides uh, greater security on, on, on the whole. Um, during the past year, uh, we at NIST have been heavily involved in one of the administration's initiative called the, that was referred to as the Institute for Information uh, uh, Protection. Uh, this was uh, a program that was put together with uh, people from the private sector. Uh, NIST was involved and also the uh, President's Council of Advisors in Science and Technology. Gene Bafford was a, a participant in that effort. One of the interesting things that came out of that was a R&D agenda that people felt really should be pursued by the government as a whole, in partnership, of course, with the private sector. And one of the things, one of the big items on that agenda was really trying to look at things uh, in the security area, in the information assurance area, in terms of uh, security, reliability, interoperability, and scalability. A lot of the things that we're having to deal with more and more are very large-scale op IT operations, operations that involve really uh, merging of systems of systems. And the complexity problem becomes enormous as we go forward, and quite frankly, uh, we really don't have a good understanding of how to evaluate and how to test that sort of circumstance. And I know the President's uh, Information Technology Advisory Council uh, has made that point uh, many times to the Hill, and hopefully we'll find some support for that effort. Speaking of the Hill, um, all of us in the government are uh, finding that uh, Congress is playing more and more of a role in this area. Uh, some of you may have heard of the recent uh, scorecard evaluation that Congressman Horne's uh, subcommittee on government operations issued. I think the uh, report card said the federal government agencies on average got a D in terms of their capabilities in this arena. Uh, it's clearly uh, an area that uh, we need to do a much better job of. Uh, I was coming here this morning and uh, the uh, ITAA uh, is uh, just released a study this morning that they uh, conducted that shows a, uh, the public's attitudes towards the government and private sector's ability to ensure uh, security in cyberspace and also security with respect to the privacy of information, uh, their information. Uh, both classes of our society didn't get really high marks from the public at large. Uh, government was actually much lower than the private sector, unfortunately. But I think it's indicative that we, you know, not only have a problem of uh, uh, doing the job, but also we have to overcome the problem of ensuring or uh, est establishing and increase the, increasing the confidence that the public has in our ability to do this job. We have lots of challenges, and I hope that uh, this conference will allow us to uh, come up with approaches and methodologies that uh, will allow us to do a better job. 
And I also hope that uh, it uh, really sends the right signal to those of you in the private sector that we in the government, uh, you know, there's the old cliche about we're here to help. It's more than that. It's we're here to partner with you. And I think that uh, if we do that and take that approach on these issues, that we'll be able to do a much better job going forward. Uh, certainly, I encourage all of you to question, challenge, and debate the topics in and out of the meetings. I think that's a very healthy kind of environment. We've structured the programs and so forth to allow that to happen. And I also would welcome any feedback any of you have, not only about the conference and the programs, but also the approaches that we in government are taking. Uh, we're anxious to do the best possible job for the industry and the users of IT going forward. And we certainly welcome that kind of feedback. So thank you again for being here and uh, look forward to the rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahiran. I, I, uh, I spoke so swiftly I didn't even introduce myself. I, uh, <laughs> I apparently need no introduction, I guess. Uh, uh, my name is Tim Grants, and I'm the manager of the Systems Network Security Group, and, and along with uh, the NIST folks and Larry and his folks, we, we put this conference on, and we try very hard. So uh, forgive that lack of an introduction of myself. Uh, our next speaker is our keynoter, Dr. David Farber. Uh, he's a very distinguished gentleman. He is uh, the Alfred Fittler Moore Professor of Telecommunications with the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he holds an appointment in the Computer Science and Electrical Engineering Department. Uh, he's been a leader throughout for many, many years in very fundamental developments of the computer networking industry and in, in, uh, in the academic circles. He's a uh, principal in the, uh, in the creation and implementation of uh, CSNet, NSFNet, and N NRAN National Research and e Education Network. He was instrumental in the creation of the National Security, National Security, National Science Foundation and DARPA-funded Gigabit Network Testbed Initiative. Uh, He's also a fellow of the IEEE, a member of the PTAC, the Presidential Information Technology Advisory Committee, uh, a, lifetime, a lifetime award member of the ACF SIGCOM. He's been, again, a long contributor, and he's also presently, at the present moment, the Chief Technology Officer of the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, please give Dr. David Farber a very warm and welcome. Thank you. We first have to see if Microsoft has ever forgiven me. <laughs> yes. Well, maybe. There we go. Ever since I testified at the antitrust trial, my uh, computer has gotten flakier. <laughs> That's unfair. Uh, I'll take that back. What I wanted to do today is, is talk a little bit about the future. Now, it's, we've basically gone through an exciting 15 years, 20 years, the evolution of the internet, the evolution of the microcomputer industry. We've created an environment which has fundamentally changed the behavior of this country uh, and the world, and it's created in many ways the infrastructure that one could argue has kept this country in a prosperous state for a historically long period. Yeah. Then the, now, if you look at the future, there's change, and boy, there's change. And I'd just like to paraphrase something which Andy Grove said. Change in, that comes in large chunks are the most interesting change. It's hard to read that, but that's what it essentially says. Now, if you look at the past couple of years, the past 15 years, we went from a world where we had computers without networks to a world where we currently are, we have computers with networks, and we've evolved over the last maybe five years to a world where it's networks with computers. Nobody cares about the computers. It's the network that counts. It's the access to information that counts. The cloud has sort of inverted and put us in a very interesting position of, for the future. It also says, says some things about the fact that we no longer can design computer systems without paying attention for the networks, to the network. We have to ask, are computer designs adequate for the networks of the future? And that's where I want to focus a lot of my attention. 
What's driving this change? What will drive the change over the next 10 years? And it's worth commenting that if you've seen it, if you believe that it's been a wild ride for the last 15, 20 years, you'll wait until the next 10 years. We're going into an age where fundamental changes are being made, and the fundamental driver to that change is the all optical network. I think most of you know that we've been using optics for a long time. <clears throat> but fundamentally, the networks currently take electrons, squirt them over glass pipe, go back to electrons, we route them, we switch them, whatever our religion is, we go back into optics, and we squirt them another distance of time. That's changing, and it's changing dramatically fast. The networks of the future, five years from now, we'll begin to see these deployed with a vengeance. We'll come in with photons and go out with photons. And that changes a fundamental part of our networking. It allows us to get bandwidths and capacity the like of which we haven't seen in the past. Conservative estimates, and in this business, conservative estimates are sometimes hard to come by, says that a, a single strand of optics can probably handle something like, let's say 100 waves, will be relatively conservative, at maybe 80 gigs per wave. Okay, so that single strand of fiber, and remember there are piles and piles of fiber in any real uh, fiber, con fiber network, has the capacity of the entire US backbone, digital backbone now. And they come in thousands inside a bundle and uh, say the Quest uh, backbone networks. So suddenly we're in a position where we have a huge amount of bandwidth. Unfortunately, photons don't like to th have things done to them, as you well know. They're hard to sort of do logic on, they're hard to bend, they're hard to do everything. And what that suggests is that all our understanding of how to do networking is about to go out the window. Now, it won't go out immediately. We'll put uh, IP over optical links, all optical links, and we'll notice that the performance is nowhere near what we should get. We'll see incompatibilities with the optics world, and we'll slowly but surely move to the next generation of networking. That next generation of networking, we have very little notion about right now of what it will look like and how it will behave. Worse yet, when you come out of the network, we have no architectures, computer architectures right now that will sync anything near 80 gigabits. You might argue, well, nobody in their same mind needs 80 gigabits. Uh, when I was introduced, people talked about the gigabit networks. When we first proposed the gigabit network, the criticism that was given to us endlessly was, why are you bothering with a gigabit? Nobody will ever find a use for a gigabit end-to-end. -end. Now, that we're very, very bad at predicting the uses of things. My guess is by the end of the decade, we'll be arguing only 80 gigabits, we need more. But we have to sync that in some place, and that's going to have profound impacts on the whole edge of the network. Notice I've talked about the edge because I personally don't think the inside of the network is going to do much anymore. The edge of the network has to be thought of in terms of sources and sinks for this type of data. We have no computer architectures that can do that. What will they look like? Probably look considerably different than the architectures that we developed over the last 50 years which were fundamentally designed to run card readers and card punches and magnetic tapes. We survived in the network world because they weren't too much data coming at us. We could sort of fake it. 80 gigabits, you don't fake. While you're at it, you also start asking serious questions about, do we know how to build software systems? Are the operating systems that we currently use at all relevant? You know, can a Windows system ever sync 80 gig gigabits? You can barely sync 110 baud at times. <laughs> and that's nothing bad necessarily with that. We've gone to very ponderous operating systems. The model is wrong there. The model of our protocol stack, which sits in these machines, are too fat for the bandwidths that we have. And if, in fact, we're to utilize this thing, I would tend to predict well, we're going to be in a world where we have consider the network to be the backplane of a very, very interesting distributed system where, in fact, the machines are coupled together at memory level because that's probably about the only place we can get the bandwidth. 
and that the operating systems will go back to a model we started with. In fact, I was there, <coughs> there when Bell Labs got its first 704, and we picked a set of cards out of the file cabinet, put them together with the packages we wanted, and that became our operating system. Now, that didn't last long, pretty soon we complained we didn't have enough space. Many, many things are going on that seriously impact the subject of this conference. One of the things that I think all you recognize is <clears throat> it is very, very difficult to design security into systems after the fact. And the reason I've taken this particular bent in my talk is to point out that this is the opportune time to look forward and architect into the security, into the architecture of these future systems, the security and that we need for not only the military side of the house, but more importantly, at least from my perspective, the civilian side of the house. Uh, a healthy, secure country has to be a, a prosperous country. And if we don't have networks that can survive attack, if we don't have a net computer systems that can survive, <clears throat> survive attack, we're very vulnerable. I want to hit one more thing. As the high-speed networks are evolving, we're seeing another thing happen, and this is with my FCC hat on also. We're seeing a dramatic change in the way people are connected to the net. The notion of dial-in modems is sort of becoming passe, and the always connected home is becoming the dominant theme. <clears throat> Sometimes even you get always connected, although I have a DSL line and I debate the always connected. But those of you who have suffered, you understand that. The persistent connection into the home, followed by the, the tendency of the field, courtesy of technology like Bluetooth and other radio systems that are going to connect almost everything together in the house and maybe on me, give you a set of vulnerabilities that are very interesting. Now, in fact, an attack on the network is maybe an attack inside my house. It may impact my, not only my information systems, but whether my lights go on, or whether my refrigerator works, and whether my furnace is working. That's a scary thing, especially since none of these systems have had the least attention paid to security. The other sort of nightmare, I, I like nightmares because I think they, they show the future, is that our telephone system, which we all know and love, sometimes love, and which ha certainly has its vulnerabilities. I helped design the first electronic one, and I put in some of those vulnerabilities. <clears throat> Still trying to get them out. The, is changing dramatically. The conversion of the telephony system to IP with all its attendant benefits, is going forward at a mad rate. And it, it produces two things. It subjects our current telephone system to interconnections that were never thought of. The notion that a, a couple of kids could get together, file as at CLEC, and gain access to my SS7 was never thought of when SS7 was created. That was <clears throat> just us guys in the telecommunication industry would ever get access to that, and we trust them. We don't necessarily trust other people. The merger of the telecommunication system onto the IP network, and eventually onto the optical networks, and eventually replacing telephony with video telephony, or whatever your particular kick is, is an exciting time, but it's also a time of extreme vulnerability. And again, I plead that the design of that system as it goes forward, there's an opportunity to design security and reliability into it now. It's not going to be capable of being done after the fact. Uh, if any of you like a, sort of a, a hysterical view of the future, I commend a book that I've used as a semi-Bible for a while in, in thinking about the future, and that's Snow Crash. How many of you have read that? Just for, it's a fun book. When it got published, I'll give you a, a motivation, go read it. When it got published, Bill Gates got 200 copies internally at Microsoft, and they said, Bill, they're talking about you. It's, it's a fun book. It deals with a future 
that may be too realistic for, for comfort. Read Snowgrass and think what happens if you don't have a secure, reliable system in that world. I've already commented on this, and I've already commented on that. So I'm going to go on to the most, I think, interesting thing. If you think technology is easy, society is rough. I think all of you have already hit the problems of providing security in the broad sense of the world, were national security, and the tendency of people to like privacy and to like their not have people listen to them. And that's, that strain is a constant strain. I, one of the things that I do as a side game is I'm on the Board of Trustees of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which has endlessly sued the government in this, in this arena. And I think we'll probably endlessly have to continue to sue it. But I think we have a responsibility as professionals to realize that everything has changed and as we design security in for national purposes and for industrial purposes, I think we have to pay attention to the individual and the countries. And I just point out, and I'm talking to the converted here, that in fact, the internet and its future distorts almost everything we know. Nation states have become less and less clear what they do. And we, they certainly defend their countries, but it's getting more and more difficult to defend their financial status. It's much more difficult to defend their culture and the rights of their citizens. And you can see the Europeans complaining about that, we complain about it, everybody complains about it, because no longer do you control your citizens' information. That's spread around the world increasingly more rapidly. We have the capabilities of producing in 1984 that would be, uh, that he was incapable of even thinking about in his novel, Orwell's novel. The 1984 when Big Brother is watching everything and so is everybody else is a scary thing to some people. And remember, one of the things about technology is like it or not, if society doesn't accept it at some point, we're going to be in trouble deploying that technology. So I, I plead to you that security and robustness can be supportive of the individual privacy. They don't have to be oppositions. Law enforcement can help individual privacy. It doesn't have to take it away. It's our choice to make, and it's our society's demand, I believe, that it be made. I think, yeah. Just uh, one final comment. We, we have great sort of visions of the e-commerce world, the future. <clears throat> I think in spite of a sort of hiccup in the stock market, if you notice, there are more dot-coms being funded now than there ever were. What we're doing is a filtering test. That the good ones stay, the bad ones sort of die. That's going to get even more profound, and the e-commerce is going to be worldwide. That cannot exist without secure, reliable networks. So I think I've thrown out two challenges for you. <clears throat> we have problems now. We have a vulnerable network. It is very, very vulnerable. It was built by kids who trusted each other. It was built largely by graduate students. Some of that code is still there. Heaven for a fact, I know, <clears throat> I know most of the graduate students who did it. We're sort of stepping on a very icy surface. We're going to have to fix that. There's no question about it. It's going to be a hard fix. But the technology is not going to allow us to just fit that, fix that. By the time we fix it, the glasses will be standing on a piece of glass on top of a bed of ice as this new technology comes in. And so please worry about that next generation. It will be certainly your children's legacy what you do now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spafford, for a very thought-provoking uh, keynote address. I'm sorry, Dr. Farber. <laughs> Getting ahead of myself here. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Uh, the National Computer System Security Award was established in 1988 and is granted for outstanding contributions towards the advancement of computer security technology based on the following criteria. Scientific or technological breakthroughs that resolve long-lasting problems or radically advance the state of the art. Outstanding leadership that results in dramatic improvement to the computer security community. Highly distinguished authorship that affects the primary principles of computer security, opens new fields of inquiry, or redefines major issues. And significant long-term contributions to computer security solutions through research, edification, or implementation. The distinguished list of previous recipients of this prestigious award include Stephen T. Walker, Dr. Willis H. Ware, James P. Anderson, Dr. Roger R. Schell, Dr. Walter Tuckman, Robert H. Courtney, Jr., Don B. Parker, Dr. Dennis K. Branstead, Dr. Whitfield Diffie, Dr. Martin Hellman, Dr. Ronald Rivest, Dr. David D. Clark, Dr. Butler W. Lamson, and Dr. Dorothy E. Denning. Now for the purpose of presenting the year 2000 National Computer System Security Award, I would like to reintroduce Dr. Bill Muhurin, Director of the Information Technology Laboratory at NIST. In addition, I would also like to introduce to you the man responsible for overseeing the evolution of security products, services, and operations to ensure that the federal government's national security information is free-flowing, free unobstructed, and uncorrupted. Uh, please also welcome Mr. Mike Jacobs, Deputy Director for Information Se Security at the National Security Agency. Gentlemen. And now I would like to call upon this year's award recipient, Dr. Eugene Spafford, to come forward to receive his award. The award reads as follows. National Computer System Security Award presented to Eugene H. Spafford, October 2000. For recognition of outstanding contributions to the field of computer security as founder of the Center for Education and Research in Information Assurance and Security, Sirius, and his approach in computer security through collaboration with key members of academia, government, and industry to promote and support programs and research, education, and, computer, and community service for his analysis of the Morris Worm, for developing PCERT, and the first accredited academic incident response team, for publishing several of the leading computer security books for practitioners, and for his leadership at Purdue University, one of the world's leading institutions in education of computer security graduates. Thank you all. Several times in previous years, I have sat where you're sitting and listened to others receive this award. And each time, as I listened to the description given of the award winners, I was very impressed with what they had accomplished. And I thought to myself, well, maybe someday, maybe when I get a little bit more senior and really do something worthwhile, that I'll have a chance to stand up there. And with that, I'd go back to Purdue and I'd continue pursuing some of my, at the time, seemingly strange ideas. So I was very surprised this year when I was notified that I had won the award, uh, because after all, I really don't feel like I'm that senior. Uh, <laughs> but then I thought about it a little bit and realized, well, I've, I've actually been doing this now for about 22 years as a practitioner, as a researcher, and as an educator. And uh, maybe I am a little bit more senior than I thought. And this was particularly true as I had to hold the letter at arm's length to read it. <laughs> so after listening to that description, I thought, well, maybe I had done a few things that made a difference. I was also told that along with getting the award, I would have 10 or 15 minutes to make some remarks. And that I could do that on pretty much any topic I chose to address. So I thought a really good topic, perhaps, to present to all of you is on the subject of misplaced trust. 
uh, not as a topic of discussion, but as a description of that offer. But uh, <laughs> I decided maybe I wouldn't take that approach. Uh, Instead, I was asked if I would say uh, some words about things that I've been thinking about and, and uh, some observations based on my experience that has led me up here for the day. So I'll start off by going into my Cassandra imitation. And, and for those of you who may not remember your mythology, Cassandra was someone who had been gifted by the gods with the ability to tell the future. Uh, but she'd also been given the curse that no one would believe her. And I can tell you that certainly working in the area of information security and assurance for several years has been like being Cassandra. Because we have been telling people repeatedly over time about dangers that have been ignored by the general population and by the people who produce the software. Doing my Cassandra imitation, I can tell you, as you have already heard, things are likely to get a bit worse before they get better. We are moving very quickly into a future with advancing technology, uh, and we are putting the technology into place without thinking carefully about how it may be used and abused. And really, the underlying reason is not so much technology problems, but people problems. It's not shortfalls in the technology. And if you work in this area long enough, you understand that it really is the people. It's the people who design the systems, who sell the systems, sometimes install the systems, use and abuse the systems, and even some of the people who guard the systems. As technologists, too often we try to think of a, techno a, a technology solution to these problems with people. We sit down and write programs, or we start drawing up designs for computer systems to solve our security problems, to solve our assurance problems. But that isn't the best solution in many cases. We have to spend so much time cleaning up after human error, after human mistake, because people are poorly trained or don't understand. Or we create interfaces that are so poor that people would rather turn them off than deal with them. And they make up new ways to use and break systems. As an example, let me talk about computer viruses, because I think it's something we've all had experience with. I remember going to workshops and conferences 10 and 11 years ago where we would talk about the dangers of future viruses like macroviruses. We could demonstrate them. We could talk about the mathematics of them. We knew they were going to happen. We developed mechanisms and algorithms that could be used to defeat them. But interestingly, the companies that make the programs that have the biggest problem with macroviruses never attended those conferences. To this day, they say that it's not their problem. They just write the software. It's the people who write the viruses that have the problems. It should be an add-on. Now, that's interesting in the sense that we have to pay for that. We have to pay for that human feeling, not so much the technology one. Let's look forward a few years, year 2004, if we simply project current trends we're going to have over 100,000 known viruses. And by the way, as a sidebar, 99,000 of those will originate from a software company in Redmond, Washington. <laughs> or at least on software that originates from there. So now many companies have to put these virus scanners out, but they have to keep them up to date. They have to download updates regularly, and users have to keep it turned on and not find ways around it. And that isn't working very well if you look at what happened with the I Love You uh, macro problem. If we look at where that technology is heading, again, by 2004, we're going to be seeing a new virus every 60 to 90 minutes. How are we going to keep up using the current paradigm and the current technology? Luckily, we'll have those optical networks. We'll be able to download the fixes quickly. <laughs> but we're also going to be downloading the viruses just as quickly. We can't continue to use that same technology unless we get the users involved and the underlying vendors involved. Our problem is really too much success. We put the technology out and made it so easy to use that people are using it, but they don't understand it. Your common average user can go out and buy a web TV system for a few hundred dollars and get on the network, but they don't know what a firewall is, and they're afraid that maybe they would catch a computer virus if it came into their system. They don't even know how to back up their own data. We haven't done a good job for the programmers either. 
There's such a demand now that we basically give high school students copies of Dummy's Guide to C and HTML and then give them jobs. <laughs> so we shouldn't be very surprised that we end up having desktop systems with 30 million lines of code with all kinds of buffer overflows and pointer problems and protocol errors. And as a result, the human cost is not simply in security problems, but in the hundreds of years of personnel time spent simply staring at blue screens waiting for the system to restart. <laughs> That's an incredible loss of human potential and time. And it's not simply a security problem. We give system administrators tens of thousands of systems to administer, and we allow the users to have software that they can download and install their own patches and programs without any kind of guards or policy in place. Industry is aware of these problems, and so they're trying to do things to protect themselves. Not protect us, protect themselves. For instance, the push to pass the UCEDA legislation. If you haven't heard about UCEDA, you need to educate yourself because it's basically going to give them a mechanism to absolve themselves of all liability. Uh, if you need a pointer to that, you can see an editorial in uh, issue 38 of IEEE Cipher, or about two months ago, Barb Simon's editorial on the issue. It's going to affect all of you, and it's going to affect your security. Uh, yeah, and you see it was passed in Maryland and Virginia, so those of you living in this area have particular concern, or should. Basically, the problem is everybody in the loop here is looking for the cheapest way out with a maximum possible payoff. They don't want to really do the heavy lifting involved to make things work right. <coughs> but security is bound completely with quality. We can't bypass that. My students, several of whom are here, current and former, uh, seem to like my analogies, so I, I came up with one here that I put in so they could add to the web page. They said they were going to take notes. But um, what we do in security is very much like being heart doctors, cardiac specialists. Our patients know that lack of exercise, too much fat, and smoking is bad for them. But they go ahead and do it anyhow because, eh, it won't happen to me tomorrow. It's convenient. I like it. And they continue to smoke until they have that, that infarction, that heart attack. And then they want a magic pill that will cure them overnight. They want it cheap, and they want it fast, and they want it to work for all of them. They're not willing to put in the effort. They're not willing to make the sacrifices. And then they claim it really isn't their fault. It's genetics, or it's McDonald's, or it's the tobacco companies. Or it's our fault because we didn't do a better job of taking care of them. Well, let me just say I think we can do better. And I'm going to give you a couple bits of, uh, of my suggestions as to how we can do better. First of all, we have to start, stop thinking about the problems as purely technology problems. When we have a new problem, the solution is not to go out and write another DLL or another page of HTML code. We should really think about the problem that we're trying to solve and engineer a solution accordingly. And if it's not the cheapest possible solution or the fastest possible solution, that shouldn't be the concern. The concern should be, is it the best possible solution? Is it the one that's going to solve our problem in a maintainable way? That's the whole goal of COTS. Second, we've got to start holding companies and people responsible for problems that they introduce by not doing a good job with quality, not doing a good job with what they put out. Third, we have to recognize that the average user is really pretty darned average. The average user, not like us, the average user now are the people who work nine to five blue collar jobs and go out and are buying those web TV systems and putting them on DSL networks that are always on and leaving their systems open to intrusion or for amplification of attacks. The thought that there are hundreds of thousands of people in the country right now running unprotected systems open for distributed denial of service clients should scare all of you. If it doesn't, you haven't thought about it enough. We also have to reevaluate how we do research and education. We should be including issues like psychology, management, economics, and sociology in those things that we do. We should have those kinds of topics presented at this conference. We should be focusing on addressing the problems of actual deployment and use instead of deriving yet more esoteric mathematical models that users won't accept and vendors won't build because they're too expensive and too hard to use. We should be exploring how to build cost-effective security that can be included out of the box and in manners that users want to turn it on. 
Those aren't technology issues. Those are psychology issues and economic issues. It isn't going to be easy, however, because companies are so eager to hire programmers with only a se semester or two of programming experience, we can't keep them long enough to teach them this. And the academic environment tends to reward success in very narrow depth areas rather than in breadth. And in a way, that brings me back to why I'm up here talking. I've spent the last dozen years trying to find synergy among various fields. And the whole research and education program at Sirius at Purdue is multidisciplinary in nature. We have linguists working with psychologists. We're working with computer scientists. We're working with economists. And the results so far have been quite exciting. Although we sometimes have problems finding the right venues to present some of the research, because nobody quite knows what to call it. Our students benefit from this, and we're really excited about what we're doing. We'd like to encourage others to do that. As I look back at my career here, I, I guess I've done a few things. and I made a list of viruses, intrusion detection, firewalls, software forensics, vulnerability scanning, attack and flaw classification, and software quality. And I'm hoping I'll be able to do more in the next 20 years or so. It wasn't necessarily I had great vision, but maybe I was there before others were, which is why I have to hold a paper at a distance. But I'll tell you, when people ask me what I do for a living, I tell them I'm a professor, not a scientist. I guess I could leave academia and I could join the ranks of some of you out there who have companies. I could start my own with a little luck and a lot of hard work. Uh, I could maybe have a financial success. I could have a product that a lot of people use for a few years. Then maybe I could join the ranks of some of you who have large stock options or getting profiled in financial magazines. Uh, who knows? Maybe even groupies. <laughs> Probably not. No, I'm, I'm a professor, like, like many people here are in this room. And we're not in this for the money. Uh, there are things that are less tangible that really mean more to us and to me. There's something very satisfying and very inspirational about being able to guide students to new ideas, to really show them something new that they haven't seen before, to lead them in a direction where they can go off and make a difference. Fifty years from now, I don't think there are going to be a lot of people who are going to be reading my books or using any of the software I developed, at least I hope not, <laughs> or, or basing things on some of the discoveries I've made. But I'm confident that I'll be changing the world still through the influence I've had through the students who've gone through my program and who I've had a chance to work with. So in closing, as a scientist, I'd like to thank the people at the National Computer Security Center and at NIST who selected me for this recognition today. I am very honored. But as one of the few educators who received the award, let me say I'm especially honored and I thank you very much for all of you for listening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Dr. Spafford. Uh, that, was a, that, that was an extraordinary experience to hear these uh, fine words. I, I, I want to add, add a personal note that uh, uh, I was in a class of his in 1983. I, I do forgive you for the B. <laughs> uh, and I did pull your fat out of the fire in that graduate course on computer law. Uh, uh, let me add, I know that you're, what you're all anxiously awaiting is for my famed administrative remarks. Uh, close out this morning's uh, uh, morning sessions. Just a couple of key points. Um, we want to make sure you do, f we need feedback. We're going to hit you over the head, not just about cell phones, but by God, we, we need your feedback. The conference gets better when you tell us what needs to get better. When we do good, you need to tell us when we do good. Uh, go that's good. To tell us when it's good, too. If you have anything bad, uh, talk to Larry's boss. If there's uh, <laughs> anything good, my boss is hanging around here somewhere, too. Uh, also remind you about the uh, award ceremonies this evening. Uh, we're first, we'll have the, uh, in room th 310, will be the award ceremony itself. And for those of you motivated by other things, food and reception follows uh, after that. So we, we encourage you to attend and come to that, as well as all the various activities. 
Again, please do question, talk to each other, talk, not go to the sessions as well, but talk outside, question, deliberate, debate. It gets better as a community when we do these kinds of things. So uh, in that spirit, let me, uh, these proceedings are closed for this morning. The next session starts at 1.30. Thank you very much. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>